so different this year than normal years, so different, because um, we live in a very different uh, reality, a very different reality today. And so, um, ah, Eileen says the sound is intermittent. Is the sound, am I coming through okay now? Yeah, give us some thumbs up or down or sideways? No, down, not good. Is it just Eileen or am I, is the sound bad for others? Give me some thumbs. It's bad for you? You're moving away from the microphone. I am? Huh. Yeah, you got to stay in one place. Okay. Oh, so the jumping around, that was a problem. So now I'm okay? Now we're okay. Okay, good, good. Okay, good, good. Nice to see you all. Nice to see you all. It's, I hope everyone's doing well today. Wishing everyone strength and blessings. And uh, I, I'm excited to, uh, to engage in some learning with you, um, as always. Today, we're going to talk about tove, spinning. You know, what's amazing about the malachu, what's amazing about the malachu, you know, regardless of whatever our personal practice is, is that these are themes we would never normally encounter in, uh, in Jewish learning, right? In Jewish learning, we're going to talk about Israel. We're going to talk about, is there a God? Right? We're going to talk about denominations. Right? We're going to talk about these, these very common themes that always, assimilation, anti-Semitism, all really important topics. But what's interesting about the Malachut um, is that, uh, is that uh, we are gonna look at themes that we don't normally look at. And so I encourage you as always to take some notes on thoughts and questions you might have. So that when we get to the Q&A, we can, we can go as rich as, as, as possible um, in, our, in our thinking together. And so, and, and as always, you think of ideas related to the concept that I haven't thought of, which are, are wonderful to hear about. I, I wanna give a shout out to my friend, Eddie. Normally AJ is working with slides. Today it's Eddie. Eddie's first time working with slides for the last class. So uh, we'll, we'll be gentle with Eddie if, uh, if we're bouncing back and forth between slides. And, um, and this is Tobit, our 16th malacha. Wow, I know some of you have been with us most of these. Our 16th malacha is Tobit which means spinning. Now that we have sheared, combed, and dyed the wool as featured in previous malachot, it's now time for the wool to be spun into thread. This involves twisting the fibers together. A classic example would be twist cotton into a thread or to make rope or twine. Most of us aren't engaged with twisting wool during the week, even on Shabbat. But then again, a lot of the malachot are not only about the specific actions they involve. Rather, the malachot help us more broadly cultivate a consciousness that can be used towards repairing the world. So let's review and now even add to our broader philosophical approach here. In case some of you are newer to this, uh, what we're doing together. Our proposal in this is that Shabbat does not need to be reduced to synagogue and meal. If most people talked about Shabbat, what they would say is, I go to synagogue and I eat a Shabbat meal, right? Those are the two most common things, prayer and food, right? 
but rather the 39 malachim constitute the central foundation of the Shabbat experience. We can't bring Shabbat prayer and meals into the week, but we can bring a consciousness of the 39 malachot that we may not, that we traditionally do not perform on Shabbat into the six, the six workdays. This is the panemia satora. Panemia satora means the inner spiritual depths of what the Torah is ultimately about, not on surface level. When we live with the 39 malachot in our collective consciousness during the week, Shabbat is revealed as we go about our working lives. Because this is the goal, to bring Shabbos into the week. Rather than say, oh, I'm collapsing after a long week, now I can enjoy Shabbos, the, I, which is part of the goal. The other is to say, how do I bring Shabbat consciousness into the other six days of the week? Conversely, when we pause from these malachot on Shabbat, we find, we remind ourselves of the spiritual meaning of these activities. We also ask whether the weekday is a remnant of the last Shabbat, anticipatory of the coming Shabbat. I would suggest, however, that we are reliving creation. Each week we, re we relive creation. On Shabbat, we are alive. During the week, we are lifeless, again, theologically, or better yet, not born yet not created yet, not yet conscious. With the consciousness of the 39 malachot, we are bringing ourselves to life, partnering in creation. It's not just that humanity is such that it's not yet created, not yet awake. More particularly, the Jewish people are asleep. The Baal Shem Tov said, Am Yisrael is asleep. He viewed his role and the role of Chassidut was to whisper into the, into the ears of Am Yisrael to reawaken Jews in modernity. We are alive during the week, but we are asleep. Our ruach, our nefesh, our neshama, our levels of soul are asleep. But our yechida and our chaya, the other levels of the soul in Kabbalah, are awake because we are alive. We can tap into the deeper light of the soul. We can find the or haganus, the spiritual light hidden at creation. We taste the light of the future in the present. All of our time is related to Shabbat. This is why in our prayers, we refer to each day as Hayom Yom Revi'i, Le Shabbat, for example. We don't call it Wednesday. There's no such thing in Jewish thought as Wednesday. What we, there's a, what we call it is Hayom Yom Revi'i, Le Shabbat. This is day four in relationship to Shabbat, right? All of the days are, are counted in relationship to day seven, right, in Jewish thought. And so let me just let me just just rehash what I just said. <clears throat> Each day of the week is like reliving creation. What we just read in Parshat Bereshit last week, at the creation story. We are not created until the end of day six, and so we are not born the six days of the week, right? We are coming into consciousness, coming into birth. On day seven, we are, are alive and actualized. So to each week, day one creation begins again. It's as if we're not fully conscious. Day seven is the pinnacle of consciousness, the pinnacle of creation, right? And so Shabbat, we bring in through the malachot, because the malachot create the world. We bring the malachot to, to partner with the divine to recreate the world, right? That is our work. Nobody, in Jewish theology, we don't claim God created a perfect world. God created a broken, messy world. And our job is to partner with the divine to, to complete creation, to perfect creation in ways that haven't been been done yet. And so the malachot are the tools that God created the world with, and there are tools to continue to rebuild the world. So now let's go to Tobit, spinning, Malachah 16. Do we mention spinning in our Shabbat songs at all? Traditionally, we mention the use of the spindle. As a reminder, a spindle, <laughs> if you don't think about a spindle every day, is a quote unquote, a slender rounded rod with tapered ends used in, in the hand hand spinning to twist and wind thread from a mass of wool or flax held on a distaff. Anyone remember where we mentioned the spindle traditionally on Friday night? We refer to the spindle in an opening Friday night dinner song called Eshet Chayu. You know Eshet Chayu from the book of Proverbs? Here's what the verse says. We're talking about the idealized women because uh, you know I love Eshet Chayu. The feminist critique of Eshet Chayu is you want a woman to do what? She's gotta do everything? 
right? You want her to be in the field and with the baby making the meal. Right? Of course, this is a fair feminist because women are expected to do and be everything to be adequate. Um, and um, and yet the it, the alternative read of Ishev Kyle is actually validating that it is validating um, a woman's capacity and just how much women have done historically and still today um, to hold up the world. And so um, here's the, what the verse says over there. She sets her hand to the distaff. Her fingers work on the spindle. The word there is fala. She works on the spindle. She gives generously to the poor. Her hands are stretched out to the needy. So on Friday night, Shabbat, we traditionally sing a song that includes this work of the spindle, of the spinning process that is done to create fabrics to clothe the world. So the process of spinning represents the virtue of a skilled and compassionate person, right? We saw Gandhi over there with over there in this process. And here we see two women here who are a part of this process as well. Spinning is not though always a positive activity. When we speak colloquially about spinning yarn, we're talking about telling a story that for the most part goes beyond the bounds of the literal truth. That can be highly destructive, of course. If the stories we tell are meant to misinform, to deceive, to misdirect, right? To spin the truth. At the same time, we do well to remember that the process of concocting a fable can be used to entertain, entertain or even to educate. Indeed, when the ancient rabbis and even some contemporary thinkers engage in midrash writing, they are spinning yarns, but they are doing so l'shem shemayim in order to elevate our thoughts and our actions by inviting us to consider the, the deepest mysteries of the Torah in terms of easy to digest stories that speak to our funny bones and to our souls at the same level. And so some dislike the, the rabbinic license that the midrashim take to say what the text in the, in the Chumash and the Tanakh does not say itself. And others find the rabbinic imagination and the creativity to be a refreshing intellectual and spiritual activity. Just as spinning can represent tale telling, spinning also relates to conversation in general. We talk today about creating threads when we communicate electronically. The fact that spinning is a malacha that was necessary to build the Mishkan, the tabernacle, as pictured here, but that is, that is refrained from on Shabbat reminds us of the differences between our conversations on Shabbat and those in which we engage during the week. In the weekday context, we either dash off notes quickly because we only have a moment or, or we craft them carefully so that we artfully and sometimes with artifice convey a thought in a carefully constructed manner. But on Shabbat, we create community with those with whom we communicate, taking advantage of the time the day gives us and the intimacy that avoiding 21st century media demands to interact in a spiritually meaningful way. If we widen the angle of our conversation in the act of spinning beyond the level of a spindle, <laughs> I've been excited to share this, but it's beyond the level at which individuals interrelate with other individuals, we can think about the use of spinning as a spiritual practice. And here we're going to get into the cosmos in a minute. We might think of images of whirling dervishes, Muslim mystics, who spin in order to attain a spiritually elevated state. If you've never checked CMAX, you can see that. Um, the whirling dervishes of Muslim mystics. But we don't, leave, we don't need to leave Jewish tradition in order to see this sort of activity. The early medieval work known as Sefer Hasidim, Sefer Hasidim says that moving the entire body while praying is appropriate in keeping with Psalm 31. It declares, all my limbs will call out God who is like you. Indeed, indeed, although many authoritative halachic sources frown upon the practice of shuckling during prayer, today the practice of moving during davening is de rigueur in many synagogues. So if you're in a, um, in, in a common reform synagogue, it will be more common to sit in one seat more calmly um, during prayer with some calm standing parts. If you go into more specific circles, we'll see more ecstatic looking prayer um, where people are moving much more. And of course, that's not always true. There are reform uh, synagogues that engage in, in dancing and Hasidic synagogues that engage in more still prayer. Um, and, and there are Orthodox synagogues that will engage in very still prayer. Shuffling is frowned upon. It, that one should be still in prayer. That's more humble than the more ecstatic. 
And actually in Kabbalistic thought, you've, maybe you've never heard this before, but shuckling is viewed as, as, as erratic. It's a sexual act with, with the Shekhinah, with the divine. One is shuckling, they're engaged in something like a sexual activity with the divine. That the energy of Devekut, the energy of connecting with, with God, is similar to the passion erotic energy that is used in correct, connecting with one's spouse, with one's life partner. Um, that there is a passion that is unleashed in such an activity um, that, is, that is similar. Now, I doubt that most people who are shuckling in prayer are viewing that as something uh, erotic. Uh, nonetheless, um, there are some spiritualists who have made that. Now here's, now, here's something I'm excited about. If we zoom out even further still, considering the matter on the level of the cosmos, we can reflect on how the planets have continued spinning because of their inertia. Planets are spinning. As we've known since the Copernican revolution in the early 1600s, planets are spinning on their axes due to the conservation of angular momentum, a law of physics. In the vacuum of outer space, objects that are spinning maintain their direction and momentum. Indeed, their spin, since there are no external forces to slow them down or stop them. And so even though planets that are rooted in the ground seem to be truly stationary, they keep spinning in our solar system. So this is kind of interesting, this notion of It actually is in sync with the spinning of the cosmos, the spinning of the planets at the same moment, right? The notion that there is stillness anywhere is an illusion. Everything is in motion, constantly in motion. We have a, uh, we have, um, a scholar actually locally here. She's a professor at ASU. who's going to be a new part of our UBM series of students of science this coming year, which we're very, very excited about. We want to do more in, um, we'll do a lot of Judaism and ethics, a lot of Judaism and theology, really a whole bunch of realms. But we're, we're now launching into Judaism and science in a really deep way. And beyond that, the Judaism and the arts um, is something we're very passionate about. We just haven't found funders to support us in that realm because there's a major gap in the Phoenix community in Judaism and the arts. Uh, but that is a huge undertaking. In any case, Judaism and science, we have someone who works particularly on this realm of, of thought. And she's going to give a talk on exoplanets, planets that are, are beyond the solar system. Um, talk much less about people we'll talk about the planets of this solar system. So the world is in motion. Life is in motion. Actually, I, you may have heard about this. If you haven't, there's a great TED talk I can recommend to you. It's five minutes long. Around um, the, race, the race to the moon. It used to be the race to the moon. It was who, who can get there first? Who can put their flag there? But now billionaires are racing for real estate. They're racing to invest in transportation. Um, and all these different issues that are emerging, ethical issues around colonialism, who, how will we colonize the moon, around um, real estate and who has ownership, around um, um, uh, systems of economy and politics, right? Uh, will, you know, will there be a capitalistic enterprise um, on the moon? And, um, and, and nation, state, nation state competition around who has rights. Um, and this is, they, they say within a decade, we will have, uh, within a decade, we will have um, uh, a lot of people living on the moon, working and living on the moon. Uh, and so, so the race is, uh, is, um, is quite frantic. Um, this is similar to the race for immortality, the billionaires who are investing in, in certain technologies. We, if you haven't read any of this, Yuval Noah Harari. And do we have any readers of Noah, Noah Yuval Harari uh, out there? So anyways, Homo sapiens, he writes a lot about, about this. Anyways. Um, the world is in motion, life is in motion. Rav Sadia Goen, who many call the first Jewish philosopher, I think he's ninth century, so he's at least, uh, I think, two centuries before Maimonides. Uh, he, 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 by the way, he's called the Ga'un because he's a part of the Ga'onic time period, right? the Ga'onic period as opposed to the Rishon. Maimonides is a Rishon. That means he's a, he's a medievalist. Um, and so he's engaged in Greek thought. Sadia Goen is, is a, is a Ga'un. And so, okay, so here's, here's an oversimplification. Uh, zero to 200 is the, ten, is the Tanayim, right? These are these, um, these are the, uh, excuse me, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the writers of the mission. Then we have the Amarayim, um, the, those who are involved in the Gemara. The Gemara is the second part of the Talmud. Then we have the kind of the dark ages, if you will, 500 to like, the 900s, 800s are like very uncreative in Jewish intellectual history. 
Um, there's not a lot to say about that period. And the, the, this is mostly the Ga'onim, and the Ga'onim go a little bit longer. And then the Rishonim, um, before we get to the Achronim, the Achronim happened in like the 1500s, 1600s. And some think we're still in the Achronim time period now, but some say the modern period is well beyond the Achronim. Um, and in traditional Jewish thought, each period has its own authority, and they can't transcend their own authority. So the role of the, of the writers of the Mishnah is to work through the authority of the Bible. The work, the work of the writers of the Gemara is to work through the authority of the Mishnah. The work of the Gaonim is to work through the authority of the Talmud. The work of the Rishonim, well, they kind of skip over the Gaonim. They don't care about the Gaonim, so they go back to the Talmud, the Rishonim. Um, and then the work of the Athanim is to work with the Rishonim. So Maimonides is a Rishon. He's the medieval time period, working with the Greek, Greek philosophy. And Sadi Gaon is an area before that. Today we call someone a Gaon if they're considered a wise person. Think the, the Vilna Gaon, Vilna Gaon. Um, he's, the, he's not of the Gaonic time period, but we call him that to me, and he's a sage. He, I can't think of any other modern person who's been called a Gaon other than the Vilna Gaon. So um, um, anyways, so, so there's a lot more to say about these two figures, but Rav Sadi Gaon teaches that we live in a centripetal universe to be understood according to platonic ideals where everything moves toward the center, toward the human being. Right? So in Plato, the human is the center. Everything in the universe is moving towards the center. This is the centripetal universe. This is an anthropocentric approach. That is to say that one sees humans as occupying the central position of his world. And that interprets everything according to the effects on humans. Everything is seen through the human mind and towards human importance. The Rambam, Maimonides, however, taught that we live in a centrifugal universe, not centripetal, but centrifugal, that should be perceived in light of Aristotelian values, Aristotle, not Plato. The Rambam rejects anthropocentrism with the teleological position that God creates, God creates everything for its own purpose. And thus the universe is centrifugal, everything moving away from the center. And the value of everything increases as it goes outwards from humans and Earth into the active intellect and beyond. So just to understand how much is at stake there, right? What is the center of existence? Humans, or is everything created for its own sake? Everything is created for its own purpose, so to speak. Is everything moving inwards or is everything still? The science of both thinkers, of course, is known to be incorrect today. We know a lot more from the Copernican revolution and well beyond. But there is still philosophical value to thinking through their approaches. In our own time, an important Jewish philosopher who just passed away this last year, Rabbi Norman Lamb, followed in the school of Rambam and wrote, there is no need to exaggerate man's importance and to exercise a kind of racial or global arrogance in order to discover the sources of man's significance and meaning. Now, Norman Lamb existed in, um, as, a, as a child of the 60s. Um, who was very taken by the landing on, on the moon and the humility that emerges from that to kind of decenter the earth from um, all of human reality and to some degree to even decenter the human being. Uh, to some that meant the human can conquer everything, the human is all powerful. To others it meant, wow, the human is so small within the cosmos, smaller than we ever imagined. So although there is, quote unquote, no need to exaggerate man's importance, there is no need to exaggerate man's importance, and there's a lot of value in expanding knowledge of the universe around us, both for knowledge's sake and for the forward march of technology that advances the cause of human sustainability. On balance, it is clear that the noble goal of reaching out into the cosmos must play second fiddle to the nobler goal of continued life on the only planet we call home. We must be invested in science, discovery, and long-term growth but we should use the long view to address today's human needs in the world we inhabit today. This tension between the value of finely tuning our perspective so that we use the mechanisms we have available to us now to meet the current concerns on the one hand and the development of broader and wide capabilities on the other hand calls to mind one more aspect of spinning. When wool is spun either with only a spindle or on a spinning wheel, the end of the wool is attached to the tool with a piece of yarn. Ironically, that means that one bit of wool cannot be made 
unless another one was spun into yarn earlier. Exhibiting comparable, ir comparable irony, one rabbinic view holds that as dusk was falling just before the first Shabbat, after the creation of the world, God fashioned a primordial pair of tongs with which the first humanly made pair of tongs could be made. <laughs> when we consider how hard it is to conceive, to conceive of the point in time by which humans had first amassed all of their devices that allowed them to meet the divine command that they exercise dominion of the world, we realize that the means that help us exercise an appropriate level of control over our world have developed over eons such that we can maintain a laser-like focus on our parochial and contemporary needs while also being aware that an ultimate conquest of the universe would require coming to grips with an aspect of infinity far beyond what humans could ever begin to understand. To conclude, when we contemplate what it means to spin, we see that it allows us to exercise the human creativity which ultimately helps us rise all the time, even as it brings us back to a spiritual center when we refrain from the activity on Shabbat. So uh, Eddie, if you'll, if you'll move back to, uh, away from the slides, just to video where we can all just see each other and speak in gallery view. Thank you. Everyone can move to gallery view, we can see each other. Um, here's the last thing I wanna say before I, mo I, I open it up. This morning I did a VBM interview, which you can watch. Um, it'll be available on YouTube and on VBM's learning library or on Facebook um, with Professor Michael Sandel who is a um, political philosopher at Harvard University. In fact, perhaps one of the most well, uh, renowned in the world. He has a class called Justice, which has been viewed by tens of millions of people. It's the most popular philosophy in the world, to my knowledge. Um, and uh, he he's, was a critic of, uh, of Rawls, but also a student of Rawls. And, uh, and he just wrote this book, which I want to touch upon here, called The Tyranny of Merit, The Tyranny of Merit. And what he says is that the meritocracy that we exist in today is detrimental. Because what it says is, if everyone just went and got a proper higher education, then um, they too can succeed. The problem is education. And then he reflects on the fact that less than two thirds, uh, uh, that more than two thirds of Americans don't even have a college degree. Um, and in fact, cannot reach a college degree. Uh, making those who have a college degree um, and a lot of moral luck that is involved with such an education believe that they themselves are responsible for their own success and that those who did not get that degree and thus are not successful are to blame for that because they had also the access to such a college degree and, and chose not to pursue that. And he says this is not just an issue of educational access and higher education, this is the source of the problem of our cultural divisiveness in American society today. That we don't have a, we don't have a collaboration towards the common good. And that is because of the resentment, the resentment that emerges among the masses that don't have access to higher education towards the elite, the elite who have higher education and thus have access uh, to the top 1% of wealth. Um, uh, feel that they are shamed and humiliated by the elites and the populism that emerges from the far left and the far right. Um, and, and Sandel is certainly critiquing both. We're very familiar with the far right populism that has emerged over the last four years and the dangers that emerge from um, those who reject truth and reject education, reject higher learning, reject science in order to advocate for just um, reckless populism. We also see on the far left um, from those also who don't value higher education, um, but also favor a, a sort of bandwagoning approach um, and, re and also reject the elite, so to speak, uh, play out very differently. In any case, this idea that if we continue with a philosophy of meritocracy, that the source of the problem is education, um, and if everyone would merely seek their own proper education, they would solve their problems, rather than find dignity in all forms of work, what today we see in a pandemic model as essential workers. Wait a minute, you're essential, but we don't value the dignity of you or your work, right? You are diminished as being, um, as being uh, not paid adequately, not valued as, on, a social, on a social level, and yet you are the essential ones that our, our country lies on. Sendell also talks about sanitation workers. Actually, he talks about how M. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about sanitation workers. 
that Martin Luther King Jr. was talking to um, a union of sanitation workers and said, your work is as valuable as doctors because doctors have to work to cure disease and treat people of disease. But without you taking care of sanitation, uh, those diseases would be so spread, uh, spreadable um, and pandemics would be so uncontrollable without sanitation work um, that actually all of us are needed to maintain society. So he says, the answer is not merely everyone needs higher education and then they can be valued, but actually we have to shift the model of what it means to be a successful American. What is success in America? And is it merely Ivy League education and then um, uh, wealth, and wealth that's even used for good. That's the narrative I grew up with and I value that still. I, I value very deeply higher education, people using their wealth towards good means and us building community around that wealth to amass power, to use that power and privilege to advocate for the vulnerable. That's a narrative I buy into. And yet there's a second competing narrative which says, um, let's actually think about inherent worth differently. Let's think about what it means to be successful differently what it means to build a family, what it means to live a life of integrity, what it means to live by certain values that goes beyond education, goes beyond wealth. Um, and so this ties into our spinning around what Sandel says, the main problem is the hubris. The hubris that comes with success is that people actually believe they're, they are responsible solely for their success. Um, ironically, they're not, they're not as responsible for their failures. Um, but they are responsible for that success. And so if we built culture more on humility, that all of us um, are not responsible for our successes, but we have had a lot of luck. And if you're religious like me, also a lot of hashkoch apprentice, which means a lot of divine help in addition to luck, um, that to get to where we are, then we can bring that humility in, into, the, into society to value um, people uh, who have different contributions in, in the world. Um, um, so uh, now let me say one last thing there. I am not of the view, um, just to be clear, and, and people can challenge me on this more. I'm not of the view that people who are doing very high level work should um, not be paid uh, a lot of money. I, I, I don't believe that, uh, I, I don't join the critique of CEOs who make millions of dollars or heads of law firms who make half a million dollars or more um, you know, um, uh, or, or even you'll hear of federation professionals who will make $800,000 a year or whatever the case is. And those who critique, geez, I thought you're serving the Jewish community while you're making X amount of money or, or the head of a university who's charging tuition that's so high. So I, I, I actually think that, um, that when you enter a realm of, people, of very few people who can, who can uh, engage in such work, um, that, they, that, that, that rewards make sense. Um, and so, I, and so I, I, I welcome your critique if you disagree. I'm more concerned with what we do for those who are living in poverty um, and uh, making sure that, um, that wealth is accessible. Um, and, and beyond just wealth, I'm thinking about economic reform, that, um, that we value people uh, and their different types of work regardless of, regardless of that wealth. And so this issue of spinning uh, brings us back to this humility. Um, this humility of what it means to create. And, I, and I, I know I've said this is the last thing I'm going to say a few times, but this is really the last thing I'll say before I open it up, that, that one of the brilliant insights of early Hasidut was that um, in, your, in your workshop, in your workshop, you can access God just like the elites in the Talmudic Academy could. You are repairing shoes, or let's say you are spinning wool, right? In your kavanah, you can engage in the most important enterprise of your life. And so for one, on a religious level, to identify success, and this is only one model of success, as connecting to the divine, right? If that was one model of success, do I live a life that is aligned with the divine? That one who is spinning wool um, in, the, in their work can achieve that um, just as just as deeply as uh, perhaps even more deeply than any other any other any other type of work. Uh, so let me let me pause here. Can I disagree with you about um, the amount of of remuneration? When I think of it, you know, I spent years working in hospital. So the CEO of a hospital maybe has a master of health admin. Yes, he has a lot of important things, but 
put him to, compare him to an eMERGE nurse or an ICU nurse who also may have a master's and may have, and she's putting her life on the line, or he. Um, the difference in remuneration is absurd, just absurd. And the guy doesn't, there's no reason that that person deserves so much more money than people who are working on the ground with the patient. Likewise, why should a hockey player get millions of dollars and a teacher just get by? It's, um, there's, there, there's a, and I think it's become worse and worse and worse over the years. What CEOs make multiple times what their workers make. Um, so I'm going to disagree with you on that. Okay, okay great, great. And, 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 and I don't want to get too, too, go, go too far down the path because there really is a lot to say and many different valuable perspectives on such an issue. I, I, I favor more trying to close the gap and there's separate conversations around taxation that we don't have to get into right now and around um, how we value people, like you said, nurses and teachers more that they are paid more. Um, my, my, uh, I, I, I just, I, my personal belief is that, um, is that that the critique is misplaced when it's primarily about 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 the rich getting rich, as opposed to about the poor getting poor. Um, but again, there's various various very valid approaches here. Okay, someone else. I find it interesting that my father's parents, who were immigrants and came here in 1905 managed on a cobbler's income to put their four sons through college. That was their predominant goal. So my question is, there are so many families here that could do that, and yet they don't because their values are not what my grandparents' values were. And because of that, I have led a successful and privileged life. Okay, thank you for that. And um, there's no doubt one of the top five reasons that, that scholars have pointed to at, for American Jewish success has been our absolute commitment to higher education. Uh, that, that goes easily in the top five reasons for those who have, have said, that the American Jewish story of success is just um, unfathomable um, in terms of what we've been able to achieve. Of course, there might be other spiritual and cultural factors at play here, but, and this is what, you know, there are some other uh, parallel cultures that, that also have done that. I mean, people have pointed to uh, other Asian cultures that value, value education on a very high level. Um, and yet, um, and yet, um, uh, I think we can hold that narrative and continue to value that as deeply as we do. And also understand that the number of, uh, Sandel says, the number of Ivy League students um, who are a part of the top 1% of wealth is higher. I don't, know if it, I don't remember if it's higher or the same number. I think he says higher than the number of Ivy League students who come from the bottom 50% of American, of American wealth, which is to say it's undeniable that um, access to higher education and more and even, even higher level uh, establishments of, 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 of higher education um, are, um, are simply more accessible based upon wealth accumulation. And Jewish wealth um, has been a part of that factor, not merely the commitments to education, the resources the American Jewish community has had in, in addition to that. And so I share with you, I, my approach would be, I would much rather live in a much smaller home with a lot less food and make sure my kids can go to college because that's like a prime value than have any access to anything else. Like I would make any sacrifice virtually on, in terms of my living condition to ensure, to ensure that. Um, and that feels like it's easy to critique someone else. And yet there are real uh, uh, barriers to social mobility and to social access that exist for populations. That the idea of taking a loan where, I mean, I came out with hundreds of thousands of dollars of student debt in com combination with them with my wife's also. Our student debt literally paralyzing, not to mention medical debt. And there are people who will choose careers 
where the option of going deep, deep, deep into, into student loan debt in order to, to try to pay that off is simply um, not, not only unwise, but um, impossible. impossible. And so um, uh, one would advise against that. Um, okay, so uh, someone else. Hi, Vicki, yeah. Hi, Rabbi. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, um, I appreciate what everybody had to say so far. Um, what I wanted to say was I appreciate very much how you can take so many strands and weave them together, <laughs> uh, but you don't leave us with a whole cloth. I think you leave us with many places to go and to think about, um, particularly how you can relate it, or people can relate it to more contemporary and time, you know, timely issues. I just wanted to add a reflection. When you first started speaking about spinning, uh, and the first slide that you had of it was Gandhi, I believe, um, was when uh, I was teaching and I had a Buddhist student who did a, a semester project on stirring the rice. And I've always thought about stirring the rice, you know, as um, sort of a mindless activity, but it's also a mindful activity as is spinning. Um, and when you're stirring rice or you're, or you're spinning thread to make cloth, um, there's a, you're moving towards making something. And for me, that brings up this notion of, you know, bringing things together to uh, arrive at some place of wholeness mm. or oneness. And from there, I would go to where you came to at the end when we get to humility, that when you are whole, truly whole, you uh, know who you are, but that also allows you to be open up, opened up to the rest of the world um, and to what your role is there. Amazing. Amazing, I love that. So there's so many things, so many powerful things you said I wanna reflect on uh, with you. Um, this notion of spinning the tapestry um, into, into, um, into wholeness. I think that um, we talk about shalom being a value and, and wholeness of course in, in Hebrew is shlemut, shlemut from shalim, from shalom. And if, 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 um, if we wanted to put one model of success in place, Jewish model of success in place. And there could be so many different ones. One might sound like this, um, that we work in our lives towards shlemut, towards a sense of wholeness within our brokenness. And that means to live with equanimity, that, that we relate to all the tensions and anxieties and brokenness of the outer world with an inner calmness. And when I achieve such an enlightened state of, of wholeness, it's almost an internal sewing of the tapestry, an internal spinning that involves what Vicky's talking about, this mindfulness, that I am so conscious and aware in a state of equanimity and of wholeness that I'm still engaged in the brokenness. I'm still sewing, I'm still spinning, but I'm in a state of inner calm, right? That nothing throws me off. The news of the day doesn't throw me off. My flat tire doesn't throw me off, right? My computer not working doesn't throw me off, whatever the case is, right? I'm in a state of calmness in relationship to that tension. I talk about this with activists all the time of keeping one's calm, keeping one's cool and social change work. This is true pastorally, people who are supporting people who are dying or people who are supporting people who are going through life crises. This is true in parenting. A child freaks out how we keep our calm and our cool. This is true for virtually anything. Um, and one might talk about this as a spiritual measure of success when we can uh, achieve such shalemut. Now, um, to go back to Gandhi in India, Gandhi, of course, is a complicated figure in Jewish thought. He, um, he is considered, you know, like, ev like everyone who dies only to, um, who is, you know, kind of sainted to be perfect. Um, and, yeah. and, and I don't have to list characters and their, and their flaws to demonstrate the point. Um, but as we know, Jewish history is complicated with Gandhi. Buber wrote a famous letter in response to Gandhi. If you've never read it, I recommend it. Just Google Buber's letter to Gandhi because Gandhi was uh, 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 opposed to nationalism uh, and thus opposed to Zionism and Buber's response there around, um, around Jewish liberationism uh, in, response to, in response to Gandhi. None, nonetheless, uh, in today's era where there's a resurgence of the idea of the validity of violent resistance as, as compared to nonviolent resistance. Um, it's interesting to reflect back on how MLK went to India um, to meet Gandhi um, and, and to reflect on, 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 on the influence there. Nonetheless, when I went to India, when I went to Gandhi's spinning wheel, um, 
I, I, I meditated that spinning wheel to think about, about why he was spinning in, in relation to what Vicky was just saying. And then I went to a med meditation retreat center down the road. And I don't talk a lot about this, <laughs> what I did over there, but hopefully none of my detractors are listening to this who will use this publicly or whatever the case is. But there was this one uh, spiritual activity we engaged in that was a spinning activity, a, sp a spinning a meditation activity where for an hour, you ran around a room spinning, trying to make eye contact with the hundreds of people you were spinning around. Um, and uh, this ecstatic, uh, this ecstatic experience of everything being in motion and humans running past each other, everyone's wearing a gown, running past each other, looking at each other. <laughs> it sounds comical to talk about. You have to kind of see it to know what I'm talking about here. But this like, your head starts to spin. And, and, and for me, one of the takeaways way, uh, was the radical interconnectivity of human life, of how interconnected we are in this constantly spinning motion. But then going back to Vicky's point, this sense of wholeness that is achieved through this chaos, right? This chaos of um, uh, that kind of emerges. Um, and yet the shleimut, if we live in a world where there's us and them, if we live in a world of pure competition and not collaboration, if we live in a world um, that is fear-based, and that's not to say that some of that fear is, is misplaced. Um, it is very hard to reach that place of shleimut. But if we actually see how much we need each other, how interdependent we are, how interconnected we are, right? The potential for peace, the potential for a world without war, is uh, is is enormous. Someone else, please. Agreements, disagreements, quick follow-up questions. Rabbi Biller, usually you wait for until the last 10 minutes. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm listening and thinking. I, I, I got my usual question of what's the piece that you take away when you're in Shabbat that what is not spinning supposed to take you to um, on Shabbat. Right. Okay, amazing. So, so, so let me uh, reflect on a few of those pieces. Um, one, I think, is to think about this Sadia Go and Maimonides argument. Yeah. Is to look under the stars, to sit under the stars, and reflect on the idea that just as we spin with our hands, that uh, the cosmos are in spinning, that the planets on their axes are spinning, and to reflect on this argumentation around centralization versus decentralization. And to think about the hubris and humility that emerges from such uh, um, uh, opposing theologies and philosophies of life. And um, what is the center? For some people, the center is God. For some people, the center is self. For some people, the center is their children. For some people, the center is their wealth. For some people, the center is the earth. For some people, there is no center. There's no such thing as a center. Right? For us to think about as I move back to the week, what is the center that I'm rotating around? I mean, it appears to be the sun, this, this light. What is the light that is my center that I rotate around? What is it that I serve? What is it that I serve? What is it that I, I would give my life towards, that I would sacrifice for? What is the belief that I offer? So, that, so that's, the first, that's the first idea of sitting under the stars on Shabbat night. The, the second, um, the, the, this, uh, this second idea here um, is around um, this, this idea that Vicky mentioned also around, uh, around mindfulness and how we use our hands in such a process in relationship to how, um, how we engage in the interconnectivity. I, I interviewed this Palestinian uh, human rights activist yesterday who talked a lot about this question of, Whenever I speak about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or any conflict, am, am I adding words um, that, to the fuel of the fire that, that, that increases the divide in the conflict? Or am I using words to bridge the divide? We can ask ourselves in everything. Am I sewing a tapestry of wholeness? Or am I ripping apart fabric? A fabric of society. We can ask ourselves the same thing in American civil discourse. 
That's not to say we shouldn't be passionate about politicians we support or condemn, right? Or about policies we support or condemn. But can I advocate for those politicians and those, and also for those policies in a way that will attempt to in some ways maintain a civil discourse, in some ways to maintain civility, in some ways to passionately and, uh, and, um, uh, and fervently argue for values we believe are true, but in a way that in some way can still maintain some wholeness to a society rather than try to destroy it. You know, I, I, I worry about this without getting into the details of the 2020 election. <laughs> But so, one of the 10 factors as to why Hitler rose to power was um, because of some scholars say the humility of Germany's defeat in, in the World War I. He, Germany was the great, um, uh, the great power of enlightenment, of reason, of academic scholarship. It was the pinnacle of wisdom in the world, right? And it was where Nietzsche and Kant and, and Heidegger and all the great philosophers emerged from German enlightenment. And not all of them, of course, but enough of them to say that this was the center of philosophy of the Western, of Western world. And when, when Germany was defeated in World War I and was humiliated globally on many levels uh, in their losses, the resentment that emerged without being able to save face emerged in a frantic and desperate attempt to recover, um, to recover power and fame and centrality globally. Hmm. And what does it mean to defeat an opposition while enabling them to save face? Now that is not to say that the reason that, that Nazism emerged was because the powers who defeated um, who won in World War I, um, you know, defeated them too absolutely. Um, that, that would displace the responsibility that, that emerged on, on German civilization. But to just look at that as one of the sociological historical factors that emerged. And then to look at defeats that we want to happen, but in a way where we can sow a tapestry of wholeness, where people cannot lose their entirety of their identity and their defeat the entirety of their needs, the entirety of their, what they place to be their dignity in a way where we can once again attempt to sow a tapestry. This is pluralism. This is how I think of American Jewish life. Okay, I wanna, I wanna sew the part of my quilt um, that I view to be most beautiful, right? But I, I know that what I'm sewing is interwoven with something else is, is sewing. It is not a separate quilt. We are ultimately sewing the same quilt. I am merely sewing my own piece, right? And um, and that means there has to be some um, acknowledgement um, so that those colors don't clash, so that those fabrics can be ultimately interwoven together. We have time for one more question or thought. Rabbi, <laughs> Rabbi, this is Carol. Um, I am I'm appalled by the media today uh, when they report the statistics on who's the polling and who's voting how. And one of the big is the educated whites and uneducated whites. I think this is hurting us as a nation to make that division. And I think you brought that out today where the elites think they have, and I consider the media part of the elites, uh, to bring that, that chasm into the discussion. We're all people, whether we have a four-year college degree or not. Yeah, right, Carol, yeah, and, thank you. And, and, and to uh, delineate between them in their voting habits may be important to pollsters or whatever, but it doesn't have to be across the work country, yeah. across the media. Great, amazing. So, so, I, so although Sandel critiques meritocracy, what he calls the tyranny of merit, um, I, I, he, he acknowledges as all of us would, 
the value of merit, right? When, if I'm having a heart surgery, I want the best heart surgeon to do that surgery. If I'm going to a lawyer, I want someone who's incredibly competent to do that, right? We want to value merit. We don't want to devalue it. We want to value education. We want to value a sophisticated discourse, right? And how do we do that at the same time, not shaming those who haven't had access to that same education? And so many books have been written over these last four years about understanding these, these uneducated white masses that you're talking about that the media is talk, pointing to as you know, the white trash, middle American white trash, middle American white trash, they're evangelical Christians, they don't know left from right, they're uneducated, they're unsophisticated, and, um, and they, are, um, they are the source of the problem, really. And uh, these books that have been written that rather than say go to war against such a population, we have to understand such a population. But Carol, I want to make sure to touch on your point in particular. So if you can, if you can hash out that point in particular, what aspect of the elite media calling out the uneducated white uh, uh, um, population as a voting block particularly disturbs you here? Did you say what? Uh, disturbs me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What aspect of that in particular? you find disturbing? Um, Is it what I just touched on? It, yeah, it, it's, it's, I think it's demeaning. Uh -huh. Okay, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, putting a sub su su a subsection to the American population, those educated and those not educated. Right, right. So it is, it is, it, right. So it, it's, it's, it's a lot easier these days to yell than to try to solve problems. And so what do we do with the anti-science uh, phenomenon? We can say, um, the, the, we can yell at these fools uh, who reject science and put us all at risk. Um, and I'm sure we've all felt that, those of us who value science. Or we can try to understand what does it mean when you haven't been educated and actually don't understand the value of science? Um, and how do we address that problem, right? Rather than merely demean these people. Um, uh, I mean, there are people there who know better. They know science to be true, and they're using this for their political gain, right? But the people who don't know, who don't understand this, who actually don't under, who actually believe, oh, all science is um, is a lie, it made up by liberal elites or something, you know, for their own political gain, that it's not really scientific research or something like this, who actually believe that to be true because they they haven't been educated with a, a science a science degree. How do we not demean such people, but actually create, uh, you know, foster a discourse? So thank you for that point, Carol. Um, thank you for that. And so, uh, so friends, I know we're out of time here, um, but um, I do, uh, I do hope you'll take up a spinning practice. If not, uh, if not a physical one, then perhaps a spiritual spinning practice. If not, like the, the folks in India, um, then perhaps another one, um, and that we can meditate under the stars together, and we can think about how Shabbat can be carried into the week, carry over into um, our ability to see the actualization of human potential as it can flourish um, when we are most conscious in all that we do and who it is and what it is we're ultimately looking to serve in all that we do. Have a great day. Thank you so much.